Hello everybody and welcome along to another one of these light and land sessions with myself and Mr. Mark Seymour. Mark, uh, nice to have you along. How are you doing? Yeah, really well, thank you. And uh, it's great to be asked to uh, come and talk to Light and Land's customers. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. You are, in theory, a Light and Land newbie, so to speak, but an extremely experienced photographer. And for anyone who doesn't know already, uh, Mark's been working for, for many years as a photographer, traveling all around the world, doing work for Nat Geo, one of the UK's very first Nikon ambassadors as well. And we'll get into a bit of Mark's background and some of his favorite places, some of his images, some thoughts about travel photography generally, street photography. And that's really exciting, Mark, because obviously a lot of what Light and Land have done previously has been more landscape oriented, albeit with tours in various parts of the world and naturally you do some sort of travel shooting. But you have a passion, don't you, for that travel and, and also the street side of things as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I love street photography. I love um, putting people in images and, and documenting people's stories. So, you know, we're, we're trying to bring another, uh, if you like, string to Light and Land's bow and uh, giving them an, an alternative so they can uh, give their customers um, another experience. But we're, we're also bringing sort of travel and some landscape or architectural photography onto those tours. So there's there's a nice balance of, of many different genres of photography yeah that's right we although this evening we're primarily focusing more on the kind of street and the travel shooting uh, mark's absolutely right in saying that a lot of the trips he's doing with flavio who's another a new light and land leader um you know to places like cuba new york india obviously it's really just about that travel experience isn't it and you're going to see all manner of things from landscapes to to street scenes to cultural scenarios and that's part of the joy isn't it mark when you visit different parts of the world is experiencing those cultures yeah it's, it's experiencing them and um it's making sure that you know the light and land clients uh, go to the right places to get the right photographs and a lot of the places we go particularly in india and you know cuba we'll talk about a bit later um they're off definitely off the beaten track and you probably wouldn't find these places unless you had done a lot of research or you knew someone there so that's the other thing we're doing. We're actually taking you to these these great places photographically or great places where you know the right people are to go and photograph them and, and have that experience. Yeah. Well, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, for We've had a few more people join the stream. It's nice to see so many of you out there with us tonight. We are on YouTube. I believe there's a slight challenge with Facebook. So hopefully everyone is, is watching us with YouTube. Um, if you are with us, do let us know. Barbara saying good evening, everybody. And uh, we've got Kevin watching from Liverpool. If you're watching along with us live tonight, do let us know in the comments where you're watching from. You never know, there might be some, someone from Cuba, New York or India, Mark, that'd be neat. Right. <laughs> um, and or Blackpool and Edinburgh, where we're also going to take Blackpool, you to tonight. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as I say, uh, Mark and I are going to go through five different locations and I've picked out some images, and Mark's picked out some images of his. Uh, they're all his work, obviously, but we're going to talk about various things to do with the actual images, to do with the locations, and also to do things you might want to think about if you're out shooting in similar places. So some tips and tricks and technique stuff as well. So hopefully it'll be a broad uh, selection of things uh, for you to take from us this evening. We'll be doing sort of 45 minutes or so, give or take. We'll see how the time takes us. And hello to Roger in Worcestershire and Phil from Fife. Phil from Fife, that rolls off the tongue just about. So, Mark, let's get into it, my friend. Let's just jump straight in. And uh, we're first up. You're going to take us to Vegas. However, <laughs> not not the ve not the hot Vegas. Let's talk about the Vegas of the North. Where are we here, Mark? Well, we're in Blackpool. And um, I've done a couple of street photography courses um, in Blackpool. And uh, the reason we actually choose this particular week is the uh the rebellion festival takes past uh takes part this weekend as well and ah. um rebellion is all about the sort of punk revival or you know people that used to be punks in a day and they're all there just hanging around the street so for the for the morning session there's lots of these sort of just people just hanging around cafes and bars outside and um it just lends itself to sort of great uh, photographs and you know we've got one here which is what i call a typical layered picture you know you've got the main subject in the middle and you've got people either side and you know you've got a depth to the image 
but you've also got me in the surroundings that they are. And that's typically what I would call a street photograph. Yes. And that's something that as we go through this evening, you know, I'm going to try and sort of eke out and, and, and kind of highlight for people in different ways. It's very difficult to pin down exactly with all genres, isn't it? As we know, landscape can mean a myriad of different things to, sure. to different people. But that's a really interesting just first outlayer of what street kind of work might be. And, and as we've said, we're going to show some street stuff, some more travel, whatever you want to sort of put it in the box of. What it's really about is being a photographer and being aware, isn't it, of, of what's around you and reacting to that. Absolutely. And it's when we go out and, and I say we because generally Flavio and I do these courses together and, you know, there's, we, we still split up into smaller groups because the worst thing to do is when you're going around the street is to go around as a group of eight or ten people because no one gets a photograph then and the person being photographed almost feels like they're being photobombed. But um, if you just go back to that, just picture one for a second, Sam, because I just want yeah. to talk around it. And you, know, you, you'll you see images like this. And the most important thing, I think, for for people that haven't done street photography and the question that comes up a lot is like, you know, just getting that over that fear of approaching people or, or taking a shot of a stranger. And you'd be surprised, you know, most people don't mind, particularly when they're there on a festival or they're, they're doing something because they're preoccupied. So they don't even notice you taking the picture a lot of the time. Mm. Um, but the, the, when we go out, we split up, although there's 10 of us, we split up into groups of two. So at some point during the day, or if I'm with you on a, over a week period or 10 days, you know, every two or three days or, or even more, sometimes I'll be with you. I'll have a dedicated session with each person as will Flavio and we can really talk about sort of details and, and, you know, techniques. Um, and then the, the other thing as well is what we get the biggest comments on from all of our courses is the, the critiques in the evening, you know, going through people's work and actually looking at it and, and saying, look, you could make it better by doing this and seeing all of their images, no matter how good or bad they are, because you can then see where people are making sort of small errors and, you can, um, if you like, sort of just point someone in sort of the right direction. But one of my big mantras when I'm photographing on the street is, you know, heads in spaces. So no heads growing out of heads. So heads on top of heads. And also, you know, I want to see the nose. So we say, show me the nose. Because it, it takes, um, if you like, some balls to go around to the front and take a photograph. And it's very easy to take a picture of the side or the back. Um, but I want you to take picture from the front so we recognise the people and it becomes, if you like, a proper street photograph. Yeah, and actually, I'll just keep us rolling on. Yeah. Um, we've got a good number of things to get through, but I think for everyone watching tonight, and thank you very much for joining us, if you're joining us live, we really appreciate that. Do stick with us. And if you've got any questions at all, any questions at all, technique, location, queries about shooting in this fashion, equipment, whatever, just hit those into the comments and I will pick them up and we'll chat about them with Mark. Mm. You did <clears throat> you did say there, Mark, I think for a lot of maybe, especially people who are light and landers or you've been on light and land trips or maybe, um, you know, the demographic that we uh, talk to and appeal to has been more landscape, but I, like I said at the very beginning, there is that fear, isn't there, sometimes of working in and around other people, sure. taking your camera out, shooting people. Obviously, I know you know, especially if there's kids or younger people in, in the frame as well. And, it's, you know, we wanted to put this in for this reason. But you have to get in and about it. But also you have to know your, not your rights. in a, But, you know, you do have to be comfortable with um, what you are and are not able to do. That's right, isn't it? Well, in the UK, you can take a picture anywhere on public land. Mm. Um, on private land, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, around some of the areas in the city of London, that it's owned by your know, private corporations. You're not allowed to take photographs of people or buildings. Um, they do come up and try and stop you. But places like Blackpool, generally, you know, any, any events that are going on in London, wherever in the UK, you're allowed to photograph it. And you know, it, effectively, people are fair game. So mm -hmm. you can take a photograph of anything you like. You can use it for your own use. But you and you can publicize it or you can make a book out of them, but you can't use them for advertising purposes without their permission. Mm. 
commercial yeah commercial stuff like that yeah yeah uh, photograph so obviously we're talking about blackpool and the reason we're doing that one of the reasons is um there's a one day workshop that you run with flavio who's your kind of partner in crime uh for these trips and that's on the 5th of august um and that obviously if anyone is interested if there are any available spaces uh, that is available through light land there's i think there's two spaces left two it's Great. really a taster for street photography yeah uh, because you know it is a one day so you know it's it's from 10 in the morning till four or five in the evening yeah so i think if you're if you are someone who's new or who fancies shooting in a different way or challenging yourself photographically if you've been more in the landscape side of things as an example and i don't want to use that sweeping brush because i know there's lots of different people <laughs> uh, watching here um so okay great roger nice uh, question for us and i'll just flip the image forward while we wait for that Roger, question, what's the best lens to use for street photography? I know that, that may be a slightly loaded question, Mark, but maybe what do you use most regularly and why? Well, for my whole Cuba trip, and I went to Cuba last year for um, a, a tour um, and was there for three weeks, and I use one lens. And I, I probably 95% of my photography is done on a 35 millimeter lens. I travel extremely light. I use a Sony A9 with a 35 millimeter f 2.8 lens. And that's all I generally go out with. I don't take a spare body out with me. I mean, if it's a, if it's a professional job where I'm shooting for a client, I would obviously take spares, etc. But if I'm out shooting on the street, one body, one lens. Now, Flavio's a little bit different for me. Flavio loves a 50 millimeter lens. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Cartier Bresson used a 50 mil lens. And you know, look at how great his pictures are. He was all right. So it's, it's whatever you're comfortable with, but I would recommend you use a fixed prime lens. And the reason is, is you get to know that lens inside out and you know where to walk to, to fill the frame or to, for whatever part of, you know, the, the, the subject you want to photograph. Um, and the, the more you use a single lens, the better you'll get with it. And, you know, we all used to, I mean, most of the people at Lighter Land are of, you know, a similar age to myself or a little bit younger, maybe. But, um, you know, we all grew up with film and, you know, we used to have a lens, which is 50 millimeter probably and, and a kit camera or mm. kit lens and a, and a camera. And we, we got the pictures. And But now all, all the zooms are coming on. But a zoom in street photography is not a good thing because you, you, you're taken away. Um, you need to be quick. Um, you need to move in, move out, and take the photograph. You know, like a picture like this. You know, I saw it happen, and I bang, I was taking it. Um, if you hung around and you started talking to it, you'd lose that moment. And when you're zooming in and out, you lose that moment. Yeah. Um, and th thank you for the question, Roger. And um, a couple of other people have sent one in, Kevin. I'm going to come to you in just a second. Your question. I just want to pick up on this idea of layered imagery because i think you know this is a a good example of it as well it's great street photographs or photographs of people in scenarios there's often a lot of things going on and sure. it's difficult <laughs> sometimes to see that into the frame and that's why you're talking about understanding your focal lengths knowing how that's going to present when you bring it to your eye sure. but for me you know we're in blackpool i can see color i can see the seagull just going across we've got the girl with her hand on her head behind we've obviously got the flare of this woman you know Great photographs like this in this scenario have so many things to unravel, don't they? But they do. I mean, you know, I, I think this photograph is all about moments mm. um, and it's about the woman and her hair. That, that, that's what I think this moment. But you can see it's in Blackpool from, you, you know, if you like some of the mess around, but some of the, the you know, Coral Island in the background. Mm. Um, th there's some, I've got some layered images coming up a bit later and I, I'd, I'd like to sort of talk through them in a bit of detail because I, I generally feel, you know, you get good at what you practice at. And, you know, some people, you know, if you look at street photographers or documentary photographers and you look at some of the greats, you're like Cartier Bresson, Cartier Bresson, use a technique called fishing so he'd stay in a he'd find a great location and stay there and wait for the right person to come into his frame and that's the most popular method of, of street photography you know you had other other photographers like sort of bruce gilden who would just go up and if you like take a snap and and you know almost be in people's faces all the time mm. and 
the more you the more you practice a particular genre, the better you get at it. I mean, Elliot Erwitt was great at doing, if you like, pictures with people with animals and and bringing humour into his photographs. And you know, I don't just don't see those photographs ever, but I generally see layered pictures, and I just I, I just see them; they just appear in front of me. And I think it's the same with whatever genre you're doing. The more you practice at it, the better you get at it. But yeah. when you come on a course, we're there to point these things out to you and look at that layered image. And yeah, you know, we talk about it. I say, like, why don't you go in there and we start trying to develop it for for the for the, for the photographer who's with us? Yeah, and like you say, you've got a good number of of layered images, and we'll get into those a, a little bit later as well in more detail. I want to pick up just on Kevin, who left a question a few minutes ago. <clears throat> Thank you for your patience. If the focus is on people, should we be going for a shallow depth of field to reduce impact of sometimes distracting backgrounds? Um, I, I would say the opposite. You you want to be using quite a large depth, like large depth of field, something like f a f eleven. Um, because on the street, the one thing that trumps everything is moment. You know, you, you could have a beautiful but blurry background um, and not capture the moment, but you're working really, really fast. So typically my camera is set, uh, set at like 250th of a second, minimum shutter speed. Um, I've got the aperture set to somewhere like F8, F11, um, and it's gone auto ISO. And then I'm just adjusting it, the comp, the exposure compensation on on the on the wheel by my thumb. Um, and you know this this is this is a typical image here, Sam. You know if you used a shallow depth of field, the people in the background would be out of focus, or maybe even the dog would be out of be blurry. And mm. if you know, the woman at the front would be sharp, and it wouldn't look good. You know it's it's about the moment, and that's that's the most important thing with street photography. Yeah, F8 and B there. We'll, we might get into um, um, <laughs> zone focusing and, and bits like that later. It might be an interesting conversation to have as well. Absolutely. Because um, a lot of a lot of street people work in, in that fashion. Um, I'm going to keep us rolling just because we've got a real good amount of stuff to get through and I want to make sure we hit it all. Um, but thank you very much, Kevin, for your question. And if anyone else has any, um, do let us know. So, Mark, I'm going to jump us to um, Edinburgh because one of the other... Um, things you've got going on this summer is a two-day workshop uh, Mark and Flavio are doing up in Edinburgh. Obviously, this is at the Fringe Festival time of year. Am I correct in saying that, Mark? Absolutely. I mean, the Edinburgh Fringe is you know, a very, very famous festival and uh, it's on for the whole of August. So, um, you know, if you're around there, you can go there and you, you can just walk around and just there's so much going on. And uh, you know, one of the benefits with choosing venues like this for street photography particularly people who are relatively new to street photography is that there's things going on so you haven't got a hunt around that much for for great pictures you can stay in one place and just stay there for a couple of hours if you like and things will come into your frame and things will be happening um and the people you know where it when it's happening the people you know like this picture here this guy's not interested in the camera. He's focusing on what he's doing and the crowd are focusing on him. And you tend to find that with any event, uh, people are focusing on what they're doing. If they wave at you, take their picture, but they won't continue to wave. You just stay in the moment and you'll they'll get back on with what they're doing and then you can get the real pictures. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because commonly... Um you're waiting for a scene to unfold but in a normal day to day you've got to have your really your eyes about you you've got to see what's going on whereas if in here this is a different scenario those scenes are already set in some ways but you you're obviously keeping your eye out for interesting stuff happening around it so maybe for anyone who's yeah mark says if you want to find your way, way into shooting on the street having your camera out in and around people when there's other stuff happening like this then that's a really neat that's a really neat option interesting mark you've the, these images, and we've got a couple, two, well, four from from Edinburgh as well. You, these are all in black and white. Um, is there a reason why sometimes you think certain street scenes, or is it just you know how you felt at the time, or does it come it down is, to anything in particular? It, yeah, it's how I felt at the time, and but some images do look better in black and white, uh, particularly when there's you know, some contrast in in the image. Other images look better in colour. You know, let's say we we've just been to India and we've been to to Cuba and it would almost 
seem sort of sacrilege to do those pictures in black and white because there's so much color there. But uh, I think these kind of these kind of work in black and white. And uh, you know, the whole thing about these sort of images is rather than sort of trying to look for moments, once you've found a subject, you've then just got to look at the background and make sure things aren't growing out of their heads or you know, the placement of the person in the frame is the most important thing. Yeah, so, and it seems it seems an obvious one, It's but because when it's being done right, you don't notice anything wrong. So, for example, we're talking maybe here about his position, the arms, there's no one touching underneath his arms, is there? there's a bit of space there. And so you, you're looking, like you say, for those little bits of separation everywhere, a bit like people might do in a landscape or on a whatever else it might be. It's the same idea. It's exactly the same. I mean, I was out with Charlie recently and we, we were at this venue with the, uh, yeah, there's all these bushes and there was this water and then there was some more bushes behind. And it was kind of like, you need to lift your camera up a bit. So you've got separation between the water and the bushes. Otherwise it looks like they're growing. And it's, here's the same, you know, if, if I'd um, come a bit higher, then there'd be no separation underneath his arm and the person bit that's being framed by his arm. And the yeah. heads would be growing out of the arms, and that would look absolutely wrong. So, do, do you find you're having to sort of move up and down, keeping your eye? Because it's it is happening quickly, so that's just a case of experience and noticing. It is. I mean, you're right. It's absolutely experience and just being aware of all these little things, and you know that you can point them out to people when you're out shooting with them, particularly you know now with. Uh, you know, all the most of the digital cameras have, have got like a flip screen on the back and so when clients are shooting you can say look why don't you just move up a bit look at that separation then you can give if you like tuition on the fly um but it, it is something you just pick up and uh you know we're there to help people sort of try and notice these things in their pictures yeah and actually you mentioned something it was which was interesting earlier about the importance of critiquing things after so are you are you are there any general things you commonly see such as people maybe not getting close enough or not working the scene enough or I, you know what i mean yeah there, there, there's, there's two great questions there i mean the the first one not getting close enough and you know or or shooting from the front you know a lot of people are, are afraid and you know these situations like you have in blackpool or here in edinburgh it's easy to get to the front and, and take a picture because you know this this guy's doing some magicians some, some magic work and he's got the audience engaged with him so he's not looking at you whereas someone else might be very camera aware and look at you and then you may feel oh I don't really want to sort of go in there um the, then the other the other biggest thing is um is staying with the moment and I and I find that it's unbelievable the more even though you say it a lot people still don't stay in, with the same situation for a long period. And I'll just tell a very, very short story. And, you know, I did a workshop in Kolkata a few years ago. And one of the guys that come on the course, um, he arrived at the airport in a wheelchair into India. And um, India is not the most disabled friendly city in the world. And Alan, his name was, and uh, he, he said to me, look, don't worry, I won't disrupt the class he said all i want to go is be with you but just take me to the first location and then when you move again two or three hours to come and get me and he said oh, and i'll be happy and and we did that and it worked the whole week and at the end of the week we did a little review of everyone's pictures and we got everyone to put 10 pictures into into the pot and then we judged the pictures as a collective so we had 100 pictures between 10 of us and at the end of them, we got down to the final 10 and Alan had seven of them mm. <laughs> because he'd become invisible in this situation. He'd become part of the scene. Yeah. He'd stay in there and just everyone just ignored him and kind of moved around him. So, yeah, you've, yeah, you've got to... I wonder whether that whether people struggle because they feel uncomfortable or whether, you know, I don't know, or whether they just think, oh, I should go off and something else might be happening. But because things on the street are so, you know what I mean, you can go out all day and nothing, you won't get anything you're necessarily happy with. So I think if there is something, you've just got to pull that thread, I suppose. Absolutely. And when, you know, when something's happening in front of you, you know, 
you, you should shoot hard and, and edit hard. You know, you should stay with that moment and shoot it from different angles and shoot in close, step back and shoot it a bit wider and, you know, take your camera up high, then down low and just work that scene until it, until it actually fizzles out or, or stops because you never know the last pitch you might take in that scenario might be the absolute best picture. Yeah. With all the moments come into a sort of crescendo and you could have walked away and you could be walking around for another 20 minutes and nothing would happen. Yeah. So yeah, I, I always try and encourage people stay with the moment as long as you possibly can. And yeah. um, you yeah, don't, don't be afraid to stay there and, and you will become invisible. Um, I also find you know, if you, if you just work in, so we were in Paris last weekend and, with Neri like Montmartre, which is a small square where all the artists are. And photographers walk, walk it around a couple of times and say, I've done this. And yet there's people coming in every, every minute of the day, new people coming in and new scenarios happening. So you can never, you, you're never done. You yeah. could be there all day and there'd be new situations the whole time. Well, I think, yeah, patience is maybe we'll, we'll pick that up as a point as well, because it's some people might, think obviously the actual act of shooting might be faster and the movement around you might be faster but patience just like a wildlife photographer or a, or a whatever else you have to still have that element i just wanted to say about this shot i really love it because of the point of view and you know this is the guy performing and it's quite unusual to see that crowd looking at us as if we're him isn't it in a way you know so is that part of the skill is just when you see these scenes what's the unusual way to shoot this or what's the interesting pov here yeah i mean you know when i've been doing it for, for donkey's years so you know i i would see this so i'm not afraid to walk around to the back of the stage and just walk on there and i'll i'll take the view that if they don't want me there they'll say do you mind moving and i'll go yeah okay sorry i yeah. wouldn't ask him do you mind if i can come back here because by asking you're giving someone the opportunity to say no yeah, yeah. Think about it and so just do it the reason this picture works again, you know, his head is in the space, but also the other really important thing, you know, I had to wait until he looked to the left so you can identify him because if he was just looking at the crowd, it wouldn't work as an image at all. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that it's identifying that exact moment, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, well, let's keep rolling because uh, thank you very much, everyone who's watching and staying with us tonight. It's really cool. We're going to do another 20, 25, half an hour at the most, but we're going to cover three fantastic and very exciting and I would say dynamic locations because we're going to talk about Cuba, we're going to talk about New York, and we're going to talk about India as well. Now, these are uh, places uh, that we are going to be running uh, with Light and Land, Cuba. Uh, Mark and Flavio are heading over there in October. Mm. So, I mean, it, let's get into the images in just a sec, Mark. But Cuba itself, obviously, there's such a, you know, geopolitical history. But I would mm. imagine culturally that really is kind of a, a once in a lifetime trip in lots of ways. It is. And, you know, the, the image you're seeing here on screen is very typical. You know, you people dress like this on the street. It, this is not unusual. Everywhere you go, there are people dressed like this. Um, you know, it, it, if you go to the right streets, if you go into the main town where the big glitzy hotels are, no, it's a little bit different. Um, but, um, you know, we've we've really put this. I, we did the tour last year and um, we've enhanced it this year because one of the things we've we've enhanced it with is uh, uh, one of the we, we, we started off in Havana which is obviously the old town. And we're staying in the old town this time, whereas we stood out, we've stayed outside last time. So it's a lot better than the case of, you know, if people want to have an early night, they can just walk back to the hotel where everything is within walking distance. And then secondly, from there, we go off to Vinales, which is where all the, where all the cigars are, are made. And we, we're going to go to a cigar factory um, and a cigar farm and see that. And then from there, we, we're going to a place called Sinfagos, which is a beautiful town. And uh, we've hired five original 1950s American cars. And we're going to be shooting them in the town square. So we've got a, a portion, you know, that we can shoot them there. And then the, then the next morning, what we're doing is we're actually using those cars to go from Sunfagos to Trinidad. So they'll be our taxis. 
Cool. Um, <laughs> you know, it's only a two-hour drive between Fagos and, and Trinidad, but so it's it's manageable in a, in a 50s car. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Go all day in it. Uh, but again, when we get to Trinidad, we'll be doing the same. And for me, the, the two jewels in the crown are you know, Havana, the old town. And then I actually prefer personally uh, Trinidad. And, um, you know, there was a Magnum photographer called David Allen Harvey that done a lot of work out there. And um, we've met his contact out there and he comes and sit with, sits with us one evening and just talks about that experience. And um, it, Trinidad is is almost like going back in time. You see horse and carts uh, around, and you know old cobbled streets like you can imagine. You know we're around in the sort of I don't know the twenties and thirties, or even mm. before tarmac was around. It's all like that. Um, but yeah, it really is. It, it's a very very special um, place to go, and um, I think we're nearly sold out. This is a touristy part, you know, but we still do pictures here because you know this is Cuba. Mm. We we talked, I mean, we, we touched a little bit on feeling comfortable in the streets, things like that. Obviously, in the UK, you know, I think there's there's no language challenge. We're fully aware of what we can do, what we can't do. You know, in Cuba and generally when you're abroad, I think let's broaden it out, shall we, Mark? You know, there are obvious things we should always do to stay aware, stay safe. But, you know, are there any specific tips or tricks you would offer to people wherever they might be irrespective of here cuba or new york you know they're just some basic stuff yeah i I think the the biggest thing is you know just smile and be happy you know if you you approach people with a smile and and you you know you might say uh you know in india namaste um and people smile back or say hello back and i've never i mean i've been traveling for, for you know, probably 15 years doing these types of courses and I've never, ever had a problem. You know, we're looking at, this is, this is, um, you know, we, I've seen him and we've got up and we, he, I just said, can we have your picture please? And so it's, it's a totally posed picture because he had a big cigar and he's got the typical Cuban hat, etc. cetera. Um, but I, I've never had a problem. I think the, the biggest thing is, is just say hello don't be don't go in threateningly you know don't go in with your camera up at your head and just walk in somewhere you know talk to people or or just nod and, and say hello and if people don't want you to say a picture they just go no and mm. just walk away there's another million people out there um and you people in cuba and india are some of the friendliest you know i've i've encountered you know they you can take their picture they generally don't mind um I, I've not had an issue at all, but uh, you know, I go in very, yes, you know, I go in sort of very defensively. I, I you know, I, I talk to people and, and nod and sort of almost like, hello, yeah, how are you? And just it's not, respect, isn't it? Really, absolutely. it's just, yeah, it's got to be respectful. And I think it, most people you will get that back, you know, it absolutely. will generally be treating how you get treated. So, um, Okay, well, this, there's some good questions coming in, guys. So thanks very much. I'm going to pick up on these just before we do. Linda says she toured for three weeks and totally agree that Trinidad was her favourite. Um, just before I get to these, David Barry, uh, I'm going to add your questions. But Mark, you raise an interesting point that obviously this is more of a posed scene in that the, the the gentleman knew you were shooting the image, you'd agreed, and he's happy and all the rest of it. W- would you say for you your heart? It is really more in the kind of street, which is often your unknown that people, someone's taking a picture, or how much of it would you be posed? Is it whether they've recognised you or whether the guy or woman is particularly characterful? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, um, you know, sometimes you'll see a picture of, of someone who's absolutely striking. You just, you, you they've got a photogenic, a photogenic face. And I might just go up to them and just go and, and like this, just uh, and they just look at you and you just take their picture and you go, thank you, and just walk off. Um, so there is a posed element sort of going on. And it it depends what type of photography you are. I mean, some people do more, if you like, street portraits. Some people, you know, there was, there was a lady on the course last week had done more sort of graphics and, and was more interested in that side, in, um, you know, on the street in Paris. Mm. So you, know, you you can put whatever spin you like on it, um, but 
I don't know if I've answered the question there. Or not. No, I think so. I think so, and I think you're right. It does um, very much depend on on what you what was, you enjoy. I was going to ask you just to flick back two pictures, if you like, because sorry, yeah, yeah. No, no, back again. One more, sorry. Yeah. So this is what I would call you know a complex layered mm. picture, um, and I probably took I don't know forty fifty pitch in this scenario, and I and I stood in this place for nearly an hour. Uh, and I stood behind the motorbike, you know, it was just kind of was there. So it's like a barrier. And I was just waiting for, for people to come and go. And, you know, the two, two ladies sat down were fixed and then the rest, it was just kind of moving around and you're moving around just small amounts just to make sure heads don't cross with each other. Um, and then you get lucky things like the woman walked through the middle uh, and, you know, it just fills that space there. Mm. Um, so that's what I call like, if you like, this is a complex layered picture. Yeah. Uh, you know, they are, it is, it is a tough image to get, but when you get it, it's like, kind of like, wow, all this stuff going on here. It's good. It's great with the use of mirrors as well. And that that's been some, a nice thing. Yeah, that's... I, I just wish I could have got a reflection of someone in a mirror just to, for, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but still, even those reflective surfaces, and obviously on the phone as well, where their eyes are all looking, you know. So there's there's all manner of things going on, and actually, it, it's a good time to ask. And, and uh, David's asking viewfinder or potluck, and I think what what I suppose he's probably referring to is, you know, perhaps are you shooting through the EVF? Are you shooting low down from the waist? Do you mix that up? Are you shooting ever blind, so to speak? No, you know, how does it work? I never shoot blind, so nothing is potluck. I mean, you get lucky at times, but, you know, this is that old adage like Lee Trevino, the great golfers used to say, the harder I, the <laughs> practice. I practice, the, the, the luckier I get. Yeah, and yeah. that's the case with this. You know, you're putting yourself in a position where you know things are going to happen. Mm. And then it's just waiting for that moment and working it. And there might be an image where, you know, the hand is slightly different or, you know, she's brought the hand across her face or, and then it doesn't work or she's moved forward a bit. So you can't see the number in the background, all these little things move around, but this is, you, you know, I, I think the big difference between if you like a professional and an amateur is a professional makes sure he gets the job done and stays with the scenario for as long as you can to deliver the results that, that you want yeah uh, whereas a lot of people would take one picture of this they'd look at the back of their camera and then they'd move on but you know when this was happening i probably took a couple of hundred pictures here um but i wouldn't call it pot luck because i was just working the situation and waiting for different people to come through and yeah it's the same situation sorry sam no. on the um on the next picture not the one we were just going to look at with the man with the umbrella yeah. So again, there's an element of luck here, and the element of luck is the boy in the top right hand corner. So you know, this guy was repairing umbrellas on the street, and you know, I noticed the the, the correlation between the color of the umbrella and his shirt, and that attracted me. And I stayed with him for about 15, 20 minutes. And every time he'd finished an umbrella, he'd just open it out and just spin it round. So I kind of knew what he was doing. So I was expecting it. So, you know, I was just there waiting for this. And I just got lucky because maybe it's because I was there. This little boy was inquisitive and he stuck his head up there. But it actually makes the picture because it frames it. And when he did put it up there, I needed to make sure everything, you know, his eyes weren't, if you like, covered by that bar. Mm. So, you know, it was a case of then moving around. But, uh, you know, there's a layered image there. You know, you've got the lady on the left, the lady at the top, and then you've got the man that makes sure that the bar isn't going through his, his chin. And then you've got the little boy at the top. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think, like, like James says, waiting for the decisive moment. I suppose it's about, <clears throat> like you mentioned here, the first thing is recognising there's something that might be able to unfold in this scenario. So that's the matching of the colours, an interesting person, an interesting situation. And then, okay, well, I, I recognize there's potential here. And then it is those fine details, though, like you've said, uh, Mark, you know, making sure the, the bar is not in the face. Mm -hmm. Can we see the boy's eye fully? Which way is he looking? You know, so, it, you know, I think a lot of times maybe people, I don't know, you correct me if I'm wrong, because you're obviously much more into this world, but 
we sometimes see street things and we think oh that was a you know a fortuitous moment not that the photographer was lucky but fortuitous that this thing happened there this went there but it's because the guy will have been or woman will have been working all day noticed something might have happened and and really concentrated and then they have to execute that in an absolute split second it's really quite a skill you're absolutely right i mean there there is an element of luck in this because you know i was lucky that i walked past him when he was doing this so but then yeah the, the rest of it is is a skill because you've recognized it and it's not just the man it's the background as well so there's a nice solid background behind him um you know if if there were other workers behind him they would be distracting in this situation yeah yeah um mark sorry and I'm going to just put up a question from James, but Barry yeah. asked a question about editing, which I'm going to come back to, Barry. So if you're watching, just hang fire. I'm going to bring us back to that on another image. Um, James says, do you find that if you stay long enough in one place, you become part of the surroundings and people begin to ignore your presence? Uh, absolutely, James. I mean, I I'm assuming you've just joined us, James, because we, we had I told a little story about a guy called Alan um, and... Uh, I, I'm not. I can't go over it again because of, of our you know, time uh, restrictions. But um, you know, effectively, if you do stay in one place long enough, like the the shot we just looked at two minutes ago, I was invisible, and and I'm using a 35 millimeter lens, so I'm I'm pretty close to these people. You know, these aren't cropped. These images, they're they're as you see them. Yeah, yeah. So you're right. Yeah, if you if you're hanging around. Uh, and James is late to the party, but you're all right, James. Don't worry. Right. You're, you're very welcome in the party. Um, you, uh, yeah. And if anyone is coming to us later and you have missed the beginning, don't worry. You can always go back and rewatch it on YouTube and okay. pick it up from from whichever point you want to. So, um, Mark, thank you very much, by the way, because you, you great answers. And thank you, everyone watching. It's really cool to have some interesting questions. And if there is anything you want to know, um, technique wise, location wise. You know, please let us know. I'm going to keep us rolling just because someone has to be on top of this, and that is me today. Um, <laughs> because we've got two more locations we want to talk about and types of images we want to talk about. And it's so nice to have Mark with us. Mark is a very experienced photographer, has done lots of work for various publications, commercial work, and for Nat Geo as well. I mean, which is, you know, pretty hef hefty stuff. And so, over the course of that, you know, I would imagine, Mark, you, you have to find ways to make things work and to capture the atmosphere of a place and i think what's been really interesting as we've walked through these from blackpool from edinburgh from cuba and now as we get into new york and then we're going to touch on some images in india in a few moments as well certain places just have a sort of vibe don't they and what's very difficult is to then get that into our cameras and where does that you know look come from is that because we've seen things in films other images we've seen new york you know classic isn't it we so many great street photographers of years gone by you know we kind of know what that american look is shall we say so do you find you're sort of automatically getting to that or is it a case of reacting to what you find each time um you do kind of kind of get into it and you know this is really um what i call like a i don't know a chocolate box picture you know it's it's what you'd want to take if you went to america because it's it's you know the skyline behind and the ice rink and you know it, it's a relatively easy picture to take as long as you know the right location or find the location which yeah. is actually just going off on a tangent is probably one of the most important things is is um you know research 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 and you know then when you're going to places you can concentrate on shooting rather than sort of just looking around and and wasting your time hunting but uh, yeah, New York, uh, we're going there in November. Um, yeah. Really looking forward to this year. Um, I think it's going to be a pretty special trip because um, one of the things we've we've managed to we, we put down as a, if you like, a, a, an option is uh, we've hired a, a couple of um, open open seat or open side helicopters. And uh, we're going to do, be doing a sort of a half hour trip. Um, over New York, where you'll be able to take pictures from an aerial point of view, cool. so purely street photography. But you know, it's just adding an element to the course that you know probably most of us wouldn't do. Uh, yeah, on on your own, but that, having the group environment is a really cool way to do that, sure. isn't it? So yeah, Mark, Mark, and Flavio are going there thirteenth to the eighteenth of November this year. Um, Lightandland.co.uk for anything you want to see 
upcoming tours. And if you go to the tutors page, you can find Mark and you can see all the things that Mark has got coming up. And I suppose, you know, we talked about a kind of vibe and a kind of scene. Um, and we've got a couple of images here which are kind of just scream all things America. But you've got to tell me what the heck's going on here, firstly, Mark. <laughs> Apparently, this this guy is um, really well known. The cowboy is, and uh, I think he was in in a, you know a TV program years and years ago. But he's in New York, around Times Square, literally every day. This guy is just in his underpants and a cowboy hat uh, and a guitar. Um, I mean, where else but America? And um, yeah, but you know, again, it's it's he's walking around. But trying to get a good picture of him is quite difficult because he's he's not mo he's moving all the time, and getting his heading a space, but with some of the girls behind him that, that doing, and then maybe a little bit of uh, you know saying it's New York was was the difficult thing, and I think I probably spent a couple of hours just hanging around this area trying to get one or two good shots of this guy. Actually, just out of interest, then in 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 New York, obviously it's a busy place, very very well photographed but that's because millions of different scenes are unfolding every day do you, do you ever bump into other street guys out and about you know is there kind of like a bustling scene of them out there or is it so big that you don't run into each other you you, I mean, you do see other street photographers i mean if if i know them um we'll stop and have a chat i mean i was in sicily recently and um you know, I, I bumped into a guy, Ernesto Bazzani, he's a magnum photographer. We've both been doing the same course for like eight years. And, you know, it's it's kind of, you know, over the years, it's developed more. Just to start with, it's just a nod. Yeah. <laughs> I was an kind of ambassador at that time. And and uh, and now we just sit down and have a, when we see each other, we don't go out of our way to, to meet, but because we're doing the same course uh, around a small town, um, we generally sit and have a, you know, he's doing something, I'm doing something. We just bump into each other, have a coffee and a and a chat for half an hour, which is nice. But um, yeah, this this again, um, you know, I, I was looking, I saw the, the background, and then I was waiting for the right characters or right people, you know, to fall into place. But you can actually see their faces. I'd have liked the two on women with their backs really sort of talking to each other, um, mm. and that would have raised the picture to a different level. But it just screams Americana, doesn't it? And the lady with the Mickey Mouse on her head or Minnie, whichever, whichever yeah. it may be, that, that's just perfect that positioning. That's what really is, that woman in the middle with it, with it. Yeah, you said the Mickey Mouse on her head. Yeah, it's perfect. And I suppose, the, yeah, it's always getting that essence, isn't it, of the place. Mm -hmm. Can we just talk a, 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 a little bit about a tech thing, Mark? Because I touched earlier um, about the focusing side of things. This may not be exactly the best example, to be honest, but the, the question came back to my mind and thus I'm going to spit it out. Um, are you uh, working on autofocus? Are you working on manual zone focusing? What's your general feel? Okay. Um, we both work differently, myself and Flavio. Flavio is a Leica shooter um, and therefore uses zone focusing because it's manual focus. And you, know, you have to use that on the street. You, you can't focus quick enough with a moment in front of you unless you're staying in a particular scene. Um, I use the Sony A9 and the, the focusing on it is insane. Um, you know, it has eye focus um, and generally I'm using that. So I've got it set to a back button focus I use um, and I use the, the button to, to release the, the shutter. Um, and I've got it set on to tracking. So once you, you know the box locks onto a person or their eyes, it pretty much stays there. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, that's an interesting one for people if they are getting into it. Um, you know, I, I suppose even with the, I suppose the Sony autofocusing is so fantastic. I think if you're struggling with other cameras, you can, if your lens has the, depth of field previews you can use a, a zone focusing method i suppose hopefully everyone knows what we're talking about when we talk about zone focus out there if you don't hit it in the questions and uh, we'll kind of try and explain it albeit we can't do that visually with the gear but it's about setting an acceptable level of focus sure. between certain points isn't it mark and you will then know if something walks within that pretty much you're going to get most of it in focus, Everything that's, be in focus yeah. yeah that's the general gist and again um, it goes back to the question sort of someone said earlier about you know whether you're shooting shallow or depth of field or um, a, a large depth of field and yeah you know, with zone focusing you really need to be shooting at f8 and f11 because 
you know, your 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 um your depth of field at f1.4 is you know an inch or two, yeah. <laughs> yeah wafer thin did, um, you, did you pick the picture of the the two big guy the, the, the big lady the big woman uh not in no i don't think i've got it in here yeah no i don't think i've got it in here no because it's a it's a, it's a funny if you look at the bin next, when you go and look at the image again and you know, I, I I didn't notice it, and afterwards this is where you get lucky. I've got this these this big American couple. I mean, and they are enormous. These, I mean, they're like twenty five stone each, and the bin on the left is made by a company called Fat Belly, and it's got this big stick <laughs> on the side that says Fat Belly, and that's. Well <laughs> well, that's I mean, humorous moments happen, don't they? So, and it, when when we talk about those layered things visually, I suppose there can be layered things such as signage. Yeah. Um, you know, was, you know, there's lots of great examples of that in street photography where maybe the background image, something's, you know, someone's holding a scythe and then someone walks in front of it and none, thing, you know, whatever I mean. But I suppose those little moments of humour and or juxtaposition, I suppose, is That's what I'm struggling true, yes. for. Those are great things to look for, aren't they? Um, well, an image, image like this, Sam, here, um, you know, I, I, I'm always looking ahead of, of what's coming up or what's behind me. So, you know, to be a good street photographer, you, you almost need eyes in the back of your head to be aware of sort of the situations going on. And, you know, and I, I might see these guys ahead. So, you know, going back to focusing, I probably pre-focus. So probably 20 yards before or 20 meters before, I just see this group. And the, the benefit of using a prime is that I know where I need to stand to fill the frame for these people. Mm. So I'd focus on a, something, a similar distance. So I'm pre-focused. So as I walk past these guys, I just go dick, 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 and I walk and I carry a walk in. So they probably not even aware I've taken a picture. Yeah, well, I suppose speed is of the essence because as soon as people have locked in that you're doing something, they're all, you know, people always change, don't they? There's, whether they want to or not, whether you want them to or not, when there's that recognition, sure. the spell's broken. Perhaps or A new spell may begin but that spell perhaps is broken. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, we've got one more location to do. We've just got four images, everyone. So thank you very much for hanging out with us. It's really cool to go around the world with Mark and see all these beautiful places and his um, razor sharp eye for images in, in very difficult and busy situations. Um, we're going to finish with four images talking about um, India. And also I know there's a couple of questions that I need to pick up on. So why don't we just go back to them? I'm just flicking myself around here. But Mark and Flavio are off to India in March of 2024. Uh, and so that is an upcoming tour, which again, another one of those quote unquote, once in a lifetimes in a way in that uh, perhaps India, other parts of the world where you'd like to go, but maybe worried about doing it yourself or not quite sure on how to logistically do that, then a, a guided tour, a photo tour is a really fantastic way to do it in a safe, you know, organized way, still with some freedom, but still with plenty of guidance. Um, actually, Mark, before I get to the questions, because a couple of tech ones, and Barry, I'm still going to come back to you, I promise, and Jane, who are both watching. Mark, can you just explain just briefly why you choose to go to this particular part of India and maybe explain to us where we are as well? Yeah, I mean, I've been to many places in India. I've been to India nine times, um, and this will be the tenth time to India. And and I've been to many places all, all across Rajasthan. Um, I've been to Kolkata, Varanasi, Delhi, Mumbai. I've been uh, you know to Nagaland, and I spent time with the last headhunters in in the world. So I, I I'm not particularly picking on this part of india but it, it's it's absolutely fascinating this this tour is and it's it's not i mean it is india but also it's india probably like not many people have ever seen and you know we start off you fly into a place called guwati and uh, guwati has got one of the biggest temples in india there um, it's one of lord shiva's temples and uh, it's where apparently lord shiva carried his his uh, bride around or his wife once she died he carried her wherever her body parts fell there was a new temple hmm. um and there's a temple in in Gowati. So, and literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people go there every day from four in the morning um and it's constantly 
changing um, and it's it's absolutely fascinating to, to go there. And then from Guwahati, um, we um, we make our way to um, a place called uh, Tezpa, which is, if, if you like, the cultural centre of Assam. I mean, Assam is very different from a lot of India. It's very green. Um, it's almost like, you know, as green, as lush as, as the UK. There's a lot of tea plantations there, that sort of thing. Um, and then from Tezpa, uh, we go on to um, the uh, Majuli Island. And Majuli Island is the uh, largest island uh, in the, in a river in the world. And we're actually spending five days with uh, this tribe there. Um, and there, there are hotels there. and We have a chance to stay in the hope we'll either stay in the hotels or if people want to, they can actually stay with one of the families as well. We've got that kind of organized. So it's, it's a really, really special trip. Um, we're really going to be in immersing ourselves into, you know, this, these, this tribal, um, uh, you know, I can't say family, but, you know, a, a village hmm. into that sort of way of life. And then from there, we travel on and we go to the, the they're called the missing tribe. And again, we, we spend three days with them and then we travel back. And on the way back, um, we go through Kazingra Park, uh, which is a, is a is a national park that's most famous for the sort of um, the, the one horned um, rhinoceroses. And um, we'll be following those on elephant back. So we, we spend half a day doing it if you like a mini elephant uh, or safari on elephant back um, and then we go back to Guwahati and, and back home but it's it, it's not India as you would think the busy busy streets it, it's the absolute opposite um, mm. there's, only, there's only nine people on the course and I think we've sold seven of the spaces so there's only two places left but uh, um, you know there's a fair bit of traveling we're, we're you know we're traveling sometimes four or five hours each day because you know the tribal people aren't in the cities they're they're out and about but yeah uh, you yeah, know believe me when you get there it's it's pretty special yeah and i mean it's a, it's a big place you got to you got to be doing some traveling but i, I think I, i'm conscious of the time so i'm just going to jump through a couple of the images but there might be things we just want to pick out and i really want to get to those questions from Barry and Jane yeah. and if if anyone else has any final questions as well before we get there i think um Mark, what I wanted to talk about, we, we touched on it a little bit when I was talking about black and white and colour. You know, when we say India, I, you know, we have a feeling of colour. Don't well, I do. I'm sure many of us do. It, you know, that's so important, isn't it? And the types of colours you find that it's just a whole different hue, isn't it? I mean, look at this picture, you know, the, the reds and the yellows. And if you put that into black and white, it would just all be lost. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I think um, th there are traditional colours such as those reds, those oranges, those yellows. But we, we talked a little bit as well about shooting people. And, and I want to just actually bring us to this image as well. Obviously, when we're around people who are, you know, so culturally different from ourselves, we talked earlier about respecting people in the street and so on and so forth. Um you know, how is that as an interaction? I, I would imagine well, for both parties, it's interesting in different yeah, ways. The, fir the first thing is, w w I mean, I, I have a, a fixer with me. Um, it's a guy called Vishal and I've known Vishal for 15 years. And, you know, he, 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 he lives in, in northern India and he knows these tribal people. So, you know, we're making donations to their villages um, and, you know, they're, they're expecting us in. Um, and, you know, these 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 obviously aren't in traditional dress, but sometimes they're in traditional dress. And when we went to Nagaland, they they were, had all their headdresses on, and you know, we 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 were sitting down with them while they were sort of, you know, smoking, uh, God knows what. But you know, they, it was just kind of just really interesting to be in there, and you don't you don't feel threatened by them. They're quite pleased that you're there and you're showing an interest in them, and you know, if you do that people respond to that. I mean, everyone has got a story to tell. And if you you talk to people, and it might through, be through an interpreter, and, you know, Vishal is, is a, you know, people go on the course, will meet Vishal, and, you know, he, he's he's a rare person in that he, he understands all the nuances of the English language. 
as well as the Indian language and many different forms of the Indian language. So he's, he's a real asset to enabling me to, to go and visit these people. Without Vishal, it, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get access to these people at all. Mm. Mm. And I think as we just sort of rally um, to a close, I suppose this, this India trip in particular, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great highlighter of the fact that photography is a means to more interesting life experiences, isn't it? You know, it's not just the photography. It's not just the image at the end of it, using the kit, whatever it is. It is a way for us to communicate, for us to experience, for us to learn, for us to travel. And and that's so important, isn't it? Absolutely. And, you know, this is not this is not street photography, what we're looking at now. And, you know, the um, the Cuba one is the New York one is. But the India is not street photography. It's, It's documentary photography. Because you know, they're aware we're there and, and we'll be spending time with them. And there'll be times when we're not taking pictures. We might just be having a coffee with them and just sitting down and watching what they're doing and maybe documenting it. But it, it, it's not it's not street photography. It's documentary photography. Anyone who goes on this trip, you'll, you'll come back with you know, a set of amazing images and, and you'll have an experience like you won't have experienced elsewhere, I promise you. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, well, everyone, if you are interested in that, there's just a couple of spaces left, like I say, or like Mark says, sorry, and that's lightandland.co.uk. And if you go to the tutors page, as I say, you find Mark, you'll see all the stuff he's got coming up, one days, two days, 10 days, more days, uh, in all the various locations. And I happen to know, but I can't, I'm not allowed to tell you right now, um, there's loads of other cool stuff coming down the pipes that Mark is working on. Um, to new locations and different things for Light and Lands and different experiences for people to go on and, and explore and enjoy. So just as we wrap up, and Mark, thank you very much for your time. Thank um, you. Just a question here. Sorry, I've hit that one. Barry, let's get back to this. I'm going to, we'll answer this as sort of succinctly as we can. And if everyone just hangs around for the next two or three minutes, I'll just do a final wrap up. Barry's question is, hi guys, how much editing do you rely on with your images or how much do you do with your images? I've seen various street photographers who like to apply the film look, Kodachrome, et cetera, cinematic feel. So Mark, what would your answer be on that? I mean, ultimately, Barry, it's up to you. You know, I, but I think that the most important thing is to try and have a, a constant look to your images. So if you if you go to for example, New York, and you decide you want to do all your pictures in New York in black and white, use the same preset. Um, I mean, all, all of my black and white images you've seen tonight, I, I've used for years and years a, a program called Silver FX. And I just love it. You know, I, I've tried many others, but I keep coming back to Silver FX. And I've got a particular um, program in or uh, um, a, a preset within Silver FX, and I've tweaked it a little bit. And that's all I use for my black and white. So they're consistent. Um, and I think if you're, if you're putting together, you know, maybe a show at a camera club or if you're putting a little book together, one of the biggest things and, you know, that uh, professional photographers or people that put books together is, is not just about the images, but it's about color management and managing them so that all the colors look the same or the tones look the same across the whole exhibition or the whole book. And, you know, that's, that's something that's really, really worth spending more time on than if you like sort of editing uh, your your images. Mm. But um, I don't know if that answers the question, Barry, but uh, I hope it does. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think, I suppose with mirrorless these days, you can, a lot of the cameras have black and white mode. So you can at least see the JPEG preview while you're there in the field. And if you've, like Mark says, if you're committing to that black and white idea or a color idea, whatever, if you use that, you've still got the raw, but you've got that so you can work with it in the field. I think um, the most important thing, Sam, is consistency. Mm, yeah. Um, we had one guy on the um, on our Sicily course, and for the last year he shot everything in letterbox format. And that's all he shot, just letterbox format. And yeah. you may love it or you may not, but that's his style. And, and and there's a consistency to everything he's doing. And he'll be seeing like that now, won't he? Like you said, with the 35 mil lens, um, you start to see in those lengths or in that aspect ratio. And so you, yeah. you then develop that voice. Um, 
Uh, there is one thing I'm just going to mention as we wrap up. The next live stream is going to be Tuesday the 13th of June. That is going to be one of our once a month photography news show. I'll be going through all the bits and bobs that have come out, new books, new gear. Um, I'm also hoping to have a guest, a Light and Land leader with us, who uh, I won't say yet because I'm still waiting for her final reply. Uh, and we'll be talking about some of you, some of your images from tours you've been on, people who've shared those. So just keep your eye on the Light and Land Facebook uh, page and on the newsletter. We will inform you like we did this time round. There was one final question, uh, and Barry says thank you very much, Mark. Okay. One final question from Jane, which I don't want to uh, uncover sort of unopened Pandora's box here um, but Jane was asking about the Sony and the zone focusing within it and I'm Mark I'm not a Sony person but the question was I've just bought Sony RX 100 VI notice zone focusing which the RX 10 blah 4 doesn't have <laughs> can you explain this if you have time probably not very easily or quickly Jane and I'm, I think Mark might be jumping for an answer right now I, um, I, I don't know what the Sony RX 100 VI is I'm really really sorry okay. Okay. Um, I'm really sorry, Jane. I don't. Um, I would say the best place to go and find out about your camera is YouTube. <laughs> and there will be someone on YouTube who has done a little YouTube video about yeah. zone focusing with the RX10. Yeah. Uh, and just just go and search it out, and and I'm I hope it will help you. Well, there we go, Jane. When we've wrapped up here, you can go down the YouTube rabbit hole. <laughs> and if you're really struggling, drop us another comment and I'll endeavor to get some answers for you somehow. Um, but yes, that zone focusing technique generally, if you, especially if your lens has those um, those markers, is, is an interesting way to shoot uh, and or obviously autofocus like we talked about. Um, but I would just like to say we're only a few minutes over. That's pretty good, bearing in mind we've been all the way around the world, Mark. Um, <laughs> Uh, big thanks to everyone. Really great crowd tonight and lots of you I know have hung around throughout the whole thing. So we really appreciate that and for getting involved and asking the questions. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for your time. Great to chat. Good to meet you and get into some of your photography. And um, for anyone who is watching out there, Mark, hopefully we'll be back again. We're going to talk about some other locations. Happy to do uh, another talk. Happy to do a print critique or you know, lots of different things, you know, let, let's, let's talk about these things, Sam. And, uh, I yeah. really, really appreciate, um, you know, you asking me on the show and, uh, thanks for all the great questions. Good stuff. Fantastic. Well, thank you for watching everyone. Keep your eyes peeled. We're back every two weeks, basically. So me and the new show in two weeks time. And then a month after this, we've got another guest coming for, for one of the walkthrough images, but we will leave it there. Thank you very much for watching light and land uk is where you want to go if you want to go on these fantastic trips with Mark and or obviously all the rest of our team but we will speak to you again in the near future thank you and goodbye for now thank you <laughs>